morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody watching online, everybody in the room. In case you're wondering, the average age of a worship leader at Illuminate is now 17, okay? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, if you are in the room, would you just show some appreciation for Izzy Mahoubi? She's one of our high school students over here on your right who let us make sure you show her some love. Thank you, Izzy. So it's so good to be back with you guys. Thanks for giving me a little bit of time off. I uh, spent a couple of weeks there in Southern California. And whenever I'm away, I'm, I'm always uh, so looking forward to being back with you, you know, and, and to opening up the scriptures and to... Uh, applying the goodness of God's wisdom in his word. And so this morning we're in for something really special. But before, before we jump into it, I just want to, I want to remind us all that you know, as your pastors, your leadership, staff, we just, we just want to tell you we are here for you. And over the last several weeks, I know that we've talked to many, many people, and it just feels like, you know, they just say, you know, the wind has just completely gone out of my sails. I don't have any gas left in the tank. We would love to pray for you, pray with you, pray over you, do anything we can to give you a little bit of strength during this time. And so we're just going to ask one small thing from you, and that is if you would just contact us at care at illuminatecommunity.com. And as you do that, just know that a pastor will respond to you. And, and again, we want to, we just want to be there for you. We, we obviously, we know that, that this is a difficult time for, for many, these, um, this sort of season of isolation and aloneness is leading some towards some really, really dark paths. But we want you to know that the light of Jesus shines brightly. And we want you to know that we are here for you. So please take us up on that. So if you have your Bibles, we, we, we are in the book of Philemon. It's a short little letter. It's really remarkable. And I'm just, I'm so looking forward to this time together. I have been for a while. Because this is, uh, this is unique. This is an intensely personal letter written from the Apostle Paul, to an individual. It's, it's also addressed to the church, but it's most civic, specifically addressed to an indivi- individual by the name of Philemon. And the theme of the letter is this. It's all about reconciliation and forgiveness. Fits with the theme that Pastor Steve brought us over the last couple of weeks. Reconciliation and forgiveness. And let me just tell you, this applies to every single person listening, whether you're online or in the room. And here's why. Life is about relationships. It's all about relationships. You can't survive without relationships. And the reality is, Relationships are often broken and damaged and disrupted. And that is so, so painful. It's been said that there's no pain like family pain. Sometimes you feel that the, the discord amongst family members is this hurt so deeply. What do you do with that? How do you repair that? Many people, th- you know, they pick up this, this book and they think, it's so ancient, it's so out of date. How is it relative? In these 20 plus verses, I'm just telling you, if you pay attention carefully, you will find that this ancient wisdom applies more than anything you could ever find written in modern times, period. And so this this message affects every single one of us. Because if you don't have it yet, you will. If you don't have it yet, what that means is you're really young. At some point in your life, you're gonna suffer the consequences, the results of having some kind of serious disruption. It's impossible to go through life without them. So let me begin with an overview. Here's what's happening. The Apostle Paul, as I said, writes this letter and he's writing it from a Roman prison. He's been arrested because he won't keep silent about Jesus. He can't stop talking about Jesus. And the Romans don't like that. I mean, he's really, he's just one man, but what they don't like about it, you have to put it into larger cultural context. The Romans were polytheistic and they, they lived to serve and worship their many gods. And so now they have this guy, Paul, who's like, no, those gods aren't real. I don't care about those gods. I'm not going to pray to those gods. There's only one true and living God. And that's the God I worship. I bend the knee to, and I preach. And the Romans get a little nervous thinking, if we have a guy in our midst, in our culture that isn't going to bend the knee before our Roman gods, they may get upset with us and they could cause some bad things to happen to us. So they lock Paul up in an effort to keep him silent. While he's under house arrest, though, he does have the ability to get visitors. One of these visitors, somehow, some way, we don't get the details, is this guy named Onesimus. And here's what we know about him. He's a runaway servant. But he's not just a runaway servant. He's a runaway servant from the small town of Colossae. Now, he's not just a runaway servant from the small town of Colossae. When he left the household, he robbed the owner. He took some stuff with him, some money or whatever, so that he could make it outside of the household. And he's smart because the place to go if you're a runaway servant is Rome. Now, 
Historians tell us that in the first century AD, almost half of Rome's population was made up of indentured servants. See, in our day, if you have a debt and you can't pay it, you can declare bankruptcy and walk away. Not so at this time. You weren't going to walk away from your debt. If you couldn't pay it, you, were, were, you would become a servant to the one whom you owed the debt. And so that's the case for Onesimus. He had some debt that he couldn't repay, so he becomes a servant to this man named Philemon. Paul encounters Onesimus while he's in prison. Paul does what he does. He tells him about Jesus. Onesimus responds in faith and becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, somewhere in this conversation, Paul learns that he and Onesimus have a mutual contact. They both know Philemon the man that Onesimus ran away from and stole from. You know, as you live your life for God, and this is the part that many people miss, when you take your life and hold it like this, open-handed, and you say, here's the deal. I realize that I am here for a reason and a purpose. And that purpose is much greater than living for my own existence. I'm living for something greater than me. And you put your life in the hands of God and you say, God, do with me what you want the most amazing things, the most supernatural things begin to appear. You begin to experience it. So here's Paul, and he's got to be shaking his head going, only God. We have a lot of only God moments at this church. Only God. I mean, a million people in Rome, and who does God bring to me? Onesimus. I share the gospel with him. He becomes a believer. And then I learn that he's a runaway slave from my friend Philemon. Oh, and by the way, Paul is a spiritual father to Philemon. He was the man that God used to share the gospel with Philemon. God is always at work. You know, from the outside, you look in and you say, what are the odds? Uh, Well, when it's in God's hands, it's going to happen. And you see, now what Paul realizes is, first I play the role of evangelist, now I gotta play the role of peacemaker because we have two brothers who are not reconciled. We have one brother that has offended another brother. And certainly Philemon, human nature is such that you'd be like, the next time I see Onesimus, man, I gave him an opportunity, he's working for me, then he stole from me and he ran away. The next time I see him, well, he encounters Paul. He gets saved and now these two men are brothers. And Paul recognized it and he says, okay, mark of maturity, by the way. Now Paul steps into that space and he says, I gotta be the one to bring peace between these two brothers. It is an absolutely remarkable story. And what is is Paul doing? He's appealing to a principle that, that Jesus laid down, truth. In John chapter 17, before Jesus leaves, he prays for future believers. Now of all the things he could pray for, what would he say? I pray that my followers would be one, that they would be unified. Why? Why is Christian unity so important? Answer simple. Because people on the outside, when they look at the Christian community, and when they see us, they see us coming from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, and they see the unity that we have, they know what is it that's different about them. I've shared it many times. One of the most powerful examples of Christian unity is found in the book of Acts where it was in the city of Antioch that they were first called Christians. And then you get a list of people who lived in the city of Antioch, people with different skin colors, different races. And, and Paul says, you know, it was in the city of Antioch that they were first called Christians, little Christ followers. You know why? You know why the name Christian came about? Because the world did not have a word to describe People coming together from all different walks of life in unity. What do we call this? Well, the thing that unites them is Jesus, Christ. They're Christians. So unity is very important because our unity is actually an evangelistic tool. So Paul says this is important. Jesus prayed for it. Now, these two brothers need to be reconciled. This is not going to be easy because, you know, the reality is, I mean, there's a lot to learn here, right? We know it to be true. Uh, Don't raise your hand. You ever been offended by another brother or sister? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It happens. 
What do you do about that? Do you ignore it? Well, see, we have these verses that tell us that we can't ignore it. And if we do ignore it, we, we ignore it at the expense of the reputation of the Christian community. More specifically, we ignore it at the expense of the name, the good name of Jesus Christ. As Pastor Steve said last week, additionally, you are never more, you are never more like the heart of Jesus than we, when you seek reconciliation, than when you forgive. That's what the cross is all about. See, the cross is really interesting, right? Because the cross, the cross reconciles two things that culture and society has a very difficult time reconciling, right? When something bad happens, there's these two principles at play. How do they come together? On the one hand, you wanna have justice, but on the other hand, you wanna be merciful. You wanna be loving. So justice and mercy, justice and love. How do those two things fit together? The cross, that's how they fit together because on the cross of Jesus, it's the justice of God. Sin has to be paid. A righteous God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. Sin has to be punished. God can't turn a blind eye towards sin. One of the most easily verifiable truths of the Bible is that men and women are sinners, okay? There's no argument on that one, right? We're, we sin. We do wrong. God can't turn a blind eye to that. It's got to be dealt with. The wages of sin is death. That tells you how serious it is. Sin is the cause of all of our problems, all right? We should probably take it a little bit more seriously. God does. It requires death. That's the justice. But the love. Where is the love? Where is the grace? Where is the mercy? So what happens is, it's Jesus nailed to the cross, dying in your place. Mercy, grace, love, and yet justice also satisfies. You're never more like the heart of God, the heart of Jesus, than when you forgive and reconcile. So with this as the background, let's read this amazing little letter. Not packed with theology. You're not going to find a lot of theological nuggets, but you're going to find it to be highly practical. So back in the day, when you began writing a letter, it makes sense, it's smart, you addressed yourself at the beginning. Hey, it's Jason. Jason is the one writing to you. Today, we sign, we address our letters at the end. Smarter to do it at the beginning, and that's what they did. So that's what Paul does. He identifies himself. He says, it's Paul writing to you, and I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus. And I've got Timothy. He's with me. Our brother, Timothy, was Paul's younger protege, a disciple. He would go on to become a pastor. He's writing to Philemon our beloved fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister. We don't know exactly who she is, probably Philemon's wife. And then there's this this guy who seems to be a young man, Archippus, probably, perhaps maybe their son, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets in your house. Philemon seems to be a wealthy landowner. If you think of uh, several dozen people meeting together in his living room, and they're sharing a meal together, and they're praying together, and they're opening up the scriptures and they're reading together, you get the idea of what was going on in Philemon's house. He's a good dude. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I I love what Paul says here. I love all the different ways that Paul describes himself as a Christian. I love this one too. Paul says, hey, I want you to know that I'm a prisoner, but I'm not a prisoner of Rome. No, 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 don't, do not think that I am here because of Rome. I am here as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. See, my whole life is about Jesus. So the fact that I'm talking about Jesus and I'm here, I'm actually a prisoner of Jesus, not of Rome. I'm here not not because of Rome, but of Jesus. Everyone else would consider him a prisoner of Rome. But he realizes I'm on this earth to fulfill God's good purposes. And by the way, this letter is an occasion for that. I also see Paul doing something else here. And and as we read through this letter, I I think it'll make sense to you. I I see Paul kind of saying, hey Philemon, I'm a prisoner now. Um, Do you hear these chains rattling a little bit? You know, I'm under house arrest, which means I'm chained 24-7. And you hear these chains rattling? Because you see, what's going to happen, Philemon, is I'm about to ask you to do something that's going to be very, very hard. But you know, Philemon, if I can live a life that is pleasing to the Lord while wearing these chains, while in prison, I'm pretty confident you can do the right thing, having your freedom. But it's not going to be easy. Human nature is such that when offended, offend back. But I'm going to appeal to you out of love that you would do the right thing. Now, what's most amazing here, what we find out, is that Paul writes the letter and then gives it to Onesimus and says, Onesimus, 
you're going to hand deliver this to Philemon. What? What? Yeah. You're going to take the letter and you're going to deliver it to Philemon. That's Philemon's door. Philemon opens the door. I've been thinking about you. I can't believe you're here. Philemon, if you'll just take this letter, if you'll just read this letter, just read this letter. Philemon opens the letter and he begins reading it. And with the very, very first word, a name, Paul. Oh, Philemon's heart, I'm, I'm guessing it has to be racing. Paul, oh. wait a second. You know Paul? Paul wrote a letter hand-delivered by you? Oh, man, there's a lot going on here. A living, watch this, a living trial is about to enter Philemon's life. Anybody relate? You know, it's one thing to say you have faith. It's another thing to really act on it. And, and more to the point, this is the genius of Paul. Paul doesn't just address it to Philemon. He addresses it to his household, and then he addresses it to the church. Colossae, is a very, it's not a small town. It's a little town. You don't think people know? Oh, I thought Onesimus came down the road, and I saw him go to Philemon's house. He's knocking on his door. You don't think the church is going to go, Philemon, what's in that letter? Philemon, who's the letter from? Instant accountability. Well, the letter is from Paul. Paul? Paul? Paul's a big deal. That's why Paul's in prison, right? From our study a few weeks ago, we learned Paul says, Look, I know the Christian community is kind of freaking out right now because I'm here, but you're going to be fine without me. You're going to be fine having me locked up. It's, it's okay. You can do this. You can. That was his influence. Peter, Christians are kind of like, oh, no, they got our main guy locked up. Paul's the best church planter of all time. All of us other church planters, we got to bow down before Paul. He's the man. Yeah, Paul's written this letter. Um, well, what does it say? What does it say? Well, it's addressed to me. Mm -hmm. and, and what does it say, Philemon? Built-in accountability. And I'll know this. Returning to Philemon is a huge risk for Onesimus because what we know is that the law allowed for Philemon to punish Onesimus. And if he wanted to, he could have Onesimus killed. But this is huge. This is high drama. This is big. But Philemon now has Onesimus in front of him with this letter. And as he's about to read, what he's going to discover is that Onesimus has been transformed and changed. And he's taken the risk because Jesus Christ is in him. He wants to do the right thing in humility with a repentant heart. Philemon, will you read this? Verse 4. Paul says, Philemon, here's how I feel about you. Here's what I know about you. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear about you. I hear about your love. I hear about your faith that you have toward Jesus and toward all the saints. Oh, and by the way, there's a saint standing in front of you right now. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us. For the sake of Christ. See, there's a number of ways we can share our faith. We can do evangelism. Certainly, we talk. We give the message of Jesus. But not just in words, also in action. And that's what Paul's appealing to here. He's like, I'm praying that you, your faith would continue to be effective because I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. I've experienced it, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Paul says, Philemon, I hear good things about you. I know what's in you. You continue to open up your home to minister to the saints. I hear about your faith. You, man, you're a man of love, the good work that God is doing in you. Let's press in on that. Let's continue to make it effective. Proud of you. 
By the way, every Christian should have someone that they look to and say, this is my child in the faith. That's what Paul's doing. He's doing with Philemon. He's saying, hey, I'm proud of you. Man, you've grown. Look at how you've matured. And for those of us who are children in the faith to our spiritual parents, we should be in that position where they can say, hey, I see this growth. I see this maturity. Hey, your reputation precedes you amongst the Christian community. God bless you for that. Man, you, your life is giving me such joy. And this is the case for Paul toward Philemon. But again, he's pressing in on him. He says, I want you to refresh the hearts of the saints. You've done it to me. You've been a joy and encouragement to me. But then he turns the corner. Knowing that Onesimus is before Philemon, he writes this in verse 8. Accordingly, though, Paul says, I am bold enough, I have enough guts in Christ to command you to do what is required. This is Paul throwing his apostolic weight around. He says, I can tell you what to do. Remember, I'm your spiritual father. Hey, I was the one to whom Jesus personally appeared on the Damascus Road and personally gave this mission to the Gentiles. That was me. I could, I could command you to do what was right, but I don't want to do that. For love's sake. See, that's how it works in the Christian community. It's not out of compulsion, but out of love. For love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. And, oh, Paul, I'm, a, I'm an old man now. I've been in the game for a long time. I'm a prisoner also for Jesus Christ. Listen to the chains again, you know. Says it again, I'm a prisoner for Christ. So I appeal to you, and then he lands this on him. For my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And Philemon has just heard that Onesimus is a brother in Christ. He's just tenderizing Philemon's heart. Now, if you've ever been offended by someone, and you have, someone close to you, someone whom you've tried to help even, oh, man, that's a super deep scar. You know, betrayal And Philemon, he's thought about it. What would I do? Here's what I can do. But now there's this living test in front of him. And he's going to, what Paul is doing is this. He's asking Philemon, oh, I'm going <laughs> to ask for you to summon more love than you've ever had to draw out before. And here's the reality of life. The deeper you have to draw that love out, what that means is the deeper you've been hurt, the deeper you've been wounded, the deeper you've been offended. That's what he's saying, I, Philemon. I'm gonna appeal to you out of love, for love's sake. I know it's in you. You feel like you're going to have to love like you've never loved before and extend it to the man in front of you and receive him as a brother in Christ. And that's why in verse 10 you have one of the first great principles of restoring a relationship, and that is you've got to take the person back. Super, super difficult sometimes. By the way, not everybody is ready to be taken back. As Steve, Pastor Steve told us a couple weeks ago or last week, he said that the prodigal son gets to a point where he is face down, eaten out of the pig's bowl. Good Jewish boy, eaten out of the pig's bowl. And he's like, what am I doing? He hits a low. Can't get any lower than that. He's like, I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to make it right. And what does he say to his dad? Dad, I have sinned against God, and I have sinned against you. What is that? That's a repentant heart. That doesn't mean you can't forgive somebody that isn't repentant. You can forgive someone in the sense that you can release yourself from the bitterness they create in you by forgiving them. But in terms of having a right relationship and having it restored, when one person offends another and then ignores it and acts like it never happened, that relationship can't be made right. That's why three very important words in the English language that you never hardly ever hear have to be said. I was wrong. I am sorry. If you can't get there, there will always be that speed bump in that relationship, and that might be on you. Right now, you might be saying, I can kind of relate to Onesimus, I'm going to be honest. I created the speed bump. I won't acknowledge it, and it ain't going away. 
He says, I want you to take him back. Take him back into your life. Look at him. He's before you. He's repentant. He knows what you could do to him. This is his life is in your hands. But he wants to have a restored relationship with you. And so in the same way, Philemon, that God was gracious with your repentant heart, can you not be gracious with Onesimus and his repentant heart? And then in verse 11, it's super, super cool. Again, I say it like this. I'm going to nerd out on you for a second, okay? Because there's this, there's this sentence that Paul writes that in the Greek language is just a work of art. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a play on words. I'll read it to you. Verse 11, formerly he, Onesimus, was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Here's the play on words. You know the name Onesimus literally means useless, useless. And so here's how... Paul is saying it. He says, useful, that is Onesimus, formerly was useless. The Greek word for useless is akristan. The Greek word for useful is eukristan. So he says, formerly Onesimus didn't act, he didn't live up to his name. He was akristos, he wasn't useful. But now I'm sending him back to you. And now he is useful, that is, he is eucriston, both to you and to me. There's this beautiful little play on words there. And what he's saying is, right, I get it. He didn't live up to his name. His name is useful, but he was useless to you. But now Jesus has entered his life. Now he's useful not only to you, but to me. And in fact, as we'll learn, Onesimus had a a role in serving Paul in some way while he's in prison. And this tells you how committed Paul is to reconciliation, that Paul is willing to say, man, would I like to keep this guy with me? Man, man, it's great for me to have this guy on the outside helping me while I'm on the inside. But I'm going to give up all of that because you see, There's a broken relationship within the community and that needs to be made right. And that's more important than anything I might gain out of my relationship with Onesimus. Jesus prayed for unity. Here, we need to model it now. I'm sending him back. I'm sending him back. Verse 12, I'm sending him back to you and I'm sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be made by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh, he can serve you in the flesh, and also though now in the Lord. Paul says, Philemon, I know if that you were with me, you'd take care of me, but your guy, your guy Onesimus, he took care of me, but it's more important that I send him back so that you can receive him back. And maybe, Philemon, just maybe, would you think about this? It was in the sovereignty sovereignty of God. What are the odds? Maybe he was departed from you for a little while so that he could... You know, this stuff happens in your life and you're like, God, why would this happen to me? Why, Why would this happen? And Paul says, I'll tell you why. He left you. He left you so that he could be brought to me, so that he could get saved, get sent back to you. Now, not only is he gonna be a better servant to you, but he's your brother in Christ. Treat him as such. How good is that? You never saw that coming, did you, Philemon? Now, he's done his part. I've done my part, Philemon. I have confidence in you. I don't wanna force you to do it, but I think you're gonna do the right thing. Restore him, he says. Take him back. That's another aspect in forgiveness and reconciliation. You restore the person back. You support him again. That's the goal. Put him back in service as appropriate. Don't withhold love from him. So, verse 17, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. When he stands in front of you, I want you to picture me. And the way you'd treat me is the way I want you to treat Onesimus. And then there's this other element. This is just amazing how mature Paul is. It's restitution. For, re- for relationships to be made whole, restitution has to be part of the, the, the process. He says, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I'll pay for his wrongdoings. Now, Paul was a tent maker. He didn't have a lot of money. Philemon had all the money, but Paul's like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to put this in the eternal scope. I'll give up everything I have to make this relationship right. I, Paul, write with this with my own hand. I will repay it. He says, I'm serious about it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Just remember, just remember God used me to bring you to faith in Christ. But if you want me to pay his debt, I will. 
yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. You know, what causes a man to say, I will reach into my pocket and pay the debt that somebody else owes to make this relationship right? Who does that? Someone who has had that done for them. You see, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. The reason why Paul can do this is because he says, hey, Jesus has paid off my massive debt. How could I not pay off some small debt like, like this? Like, oh, what, what does that Onesimus owe you? It's a small, very small thing to me in light of all that I have been forgiven. Absolutely, I'll do it. Verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me because I, I, I plan to come back. And I'm hoping that through your prayers, as you pray for me, I will be graciously given to you. This is great. It's further accountability. It's as if Paul says, hey, I I plan on coming back. Keep praying for me. When I do, I want to stay at your house. Get get it ready for me. Um, And when I come back, yeah, I'm hoping Onesimus is there. Hoping I get to say hi to Onesimus too. Hang out with him. Spend a little time with him. Now, we don't know what Philemon did. But I think Paul's letter would have had an enormous impact on him. And I think... He would have displayed the courage, the faith, the humility to receive him back. So where do you see yourself in this story? You know, maybe you see yourself as as Philemon. You know, you've been hurt. You've been wounded deeply. And you're having a really hard time receiving that person back into your life. Maybe you're Onesimus. And you're the one who's like, hey, (laughs) I messed it up. I was wrong. And I need to go back and make it right. That's just the salve that you need to apply, to apply to that relationship. Or maybe you're Paul. Maybe you're the one who steps in and says, I'm here to help make peace. And I will do whatever it takes, even to my own personal sacrifice, in order to achieve the unity that Jesus prayed for. How is that possible, Christian? How is it possible? It's possible because you realize all that Jesus has done for you. And you're super motivated to extend the grace, the forgiveness, the restoration, the reconciliation, what good reason would you possibly have for withholding any of that from a brother or sister in Christ? There is none. So this is why of all the things that Jesus said to remember, he said, remember my death. Because if you remember my death, you will understand everything else will be put in place. Remember that through my death, the relationship that you have with God was made right. Therefore, you can make things right with your brothers and sisters. So that's how we're going to end our time. We're going to do exactly as Jesus commanded us to do. We're going to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. So Father, our deepest desire is that you would continue to speak to us through your word, that by the power of your spirit, you would bring conviction where where conviction needs to be brought. You would bring encouragement. You would just fill us with the knowledge of the good work of Jesus Christ on our behalf done on the cross who, as Philippians 2 said, in humility gave himself for us. So, Father, as we enter into this time, I pray that you would even now be speaking to every heart in the room and online. Lead us, Father, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.